name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O Lord, open up my lips so that my mouth may proclaim your praises. Lord, give me the tongue of an angel that I may speak the truth in love. I pray this in Jesus' mighty, holy, powerful, sweet, precious, majestic name, through Mother Mary's intercession, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Today's Bible study is the, it's on the feast day of the Blessed Virgin Mary, or today's the feast day, so happy birthday, uh, Mother of God, our mothers. And you know what? I want to offer to Mary just a Hail Mary, and I want to do it in Latin. You know why? Because the devil hates Latin. He's afraid of Latin. So I'm going to offer the Blessed Mother a Hail Mary in the language that the devil fears. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu Jesus. Santa Maria Mater Dei, ora pro nobis pecadoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostri. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritui Santo. Amen. All right. Welcome. Tonight we're going to talk about probably the basic, what I would call basic Catholicism 101, God the Father. As Catholic Christians, we are Christians. What is a Christian? A Christian is somebody who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, believes he's the Son of God, believes he died for our sins, believes he, believe he rose from the dead, believes he's coming back. We call that Judgment Day. Catholics are the first Christians. We're the original Christians. We're the Christians that put the Bible together, actually, at the Council of Rome in 380 A.D., as Christians, we believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that God is a trinity of persons. We believe, as Pope John Paul II says, who we call Saint Pope John Paul II, we believe that God is a communion, a family of persons that live in life-giving love to one another. Tonight, we're going to focus on the importance of the first person of the trinity, God the Father. As you take a look at the notes that I passed out tonight, my outline, you see that it says, the love of God the Father. We believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that God the Father is the, the source, and that God the Father sent God the Son into the world to die for our sins, and we believe that God the Father and God the Son have now sent the Holy Spirit the third person of the Trinity that lives in us. Therefore, all of us were children of God. If we didn't have the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be children of God. We'd be creatures of God. What's the difference between us and dogs, us and cats? They are creatures of God. Why? They don't have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a son or a daughter of God. You're a creature of God. What sets us apart is that the Holy Spirit has been given to us, which makes us now technically adopted sons of God through Jesus Christ. Okay, let's take a look at our notes here. The love of God the Father. Now here's something very interesting. As Catholics, it's quite natural for us to call God Father, but it's not natural for other people. For example, Muslims who are right now the largest religion in the world, unfortunately, um, to call God Father, or to, God, to call Allah Father in Islam, is heresy. It's blasphemy. You can get killed for that in a Muslim country. Because they don't believe that God has any children. Islam denies that God is a father because they say that God has no children. God is a master in Islam, and everybody else is slaves. Us as Catholic Christians, we believe something quite opposite. We believe that God is a father. In fact, we believe that that's God's primary title. We have, God is creator. God is uh, uh, redeemer. God is sanctifier. God is protector, God is provider, God, God is defender, God is sustainer. God is a lot of things. God is lawgiver. But before that, God's primary title is Father. Why? God only became a lawgiver when He gave the law. God only became the creator when He created something. But God 
has been Father forever. That's who He is in His essence. Because God, the Father, has always lived in communion with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So God is Father forever. That's who He is. Let's go to your notes here. Let's take a look. The Holy Trinity in action. When we say Holy Trinity, that means as Catholic Christians that we believe that God is a Trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's look at the dynamic of the Holy Trinity in action. If you've got a Bible, you can flip over to John 14, 16, and then we'll look, I'll take a look at also John 14, 26. <clears throat> what the Bible clearly says here is that the Father sends the Holy Spirit. Let me read that, John 14, 16. The Bible says, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to be with you always, the Spirit of truth, which the world cannot accept, because it neither sees nor knows it, but you know it, because it remains with you and will be in you. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Take a look at John 14, 26. Jesus says, the advocate, by the way, this is the second time Jesus uses the word the advocate. What does the word advocate mean in Greek? It means lawyer. Okay? That's what the Holy Spirit is. He's our lawyer. He pleads our cause. He defends us before the tribunal of God. John 14, 26, Jesus says, The advocate, the Holy Spirit, that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. The word of the Lord. So we see very clearly, the Bible says that the Father sends the Holy Spirit to us. There are two things that happen. Now, we're not creatures of God. Now, I'm a child of God. I can call God my Father because the Holy Spirit lives in me. The Spirit that my, my Father has sent me from heaven, which now brings me into the family of God. If I didn't have the Holy Spirit through baptism, and if you didn't have the Holy Spirit, you'd be a creature or a monster of God. But because God has given us the Holy Spirit, now we can say, Dad, Papacito, Abba, Father. Because His Spirit lives in us that He gave us. Let's take a look at the second, number two. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us. Okay? Now that we have the Holy Spirit that we receive through baptism... The Holy Spirit now reveals throughout the course of our life, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. The Bible says, for in, one, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we are all given to drink of the one spirit. The word of the Lord. So we were all given to drink of the one spirit. Go to John chapter 16. John, no, excuse me. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. That's actually a typo in the notes. It should actually be 1 Corinthians 12, 3, not 13. So fix that in your notes. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Here's what it says. Therefore I tell you that nobody speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Very clear Bible verse. The only reason that you can say Jesus and it can roll off your lips like honey is because you have the Holy Spirit. A Satanist, somebody who hates Jesus, they can't say his name. I know. I'm a retired Los Angeles cop. For the first couple of years in the Sheriff's Department in L.A., I worked in the Los Angeles County Jail. There's a section in the L.A. County Jail that has all the serial killers that are about to be transported up north to the prisons, many of them to death row, after they've been convicted of their heinous crimes. I remember when I was young, I was 20, 21 years old, you know, fresh out of the academy, I would walk down, because you have to do a count uh, every 20 minutes, you have to do what's called a suicide count to make sure they don't kill themselves, so you walk every 20 minutes and you open the steel door, the steel door, and they have to stand up. The, the serial killer, the, the, the inmate has to stand up and he has to say, one man standing, then he can go sit down again. Every 20 minutes you do that. They have to stand up and they got to say, one man standing. It's a suicide uh, watch. 
And I remember a couple of these guys that I talked to, and some of these guys were the worst killers in California. I remember this one guy, Rich Ramirez, I'll spare you the details. He killed 27 prostitutes. We convicted him of 14 murders. The other 13 he admitted to later. And uh, let's just say that he, he uh, most of his victims ended up, their body parts ended up in pickle jars in formaldehyde in his refrigerator. Uh, he would mail body parts to the family members, like eyeballs and ears and stuff. He was a monster. He was a monster. As many of them were that I met. See, that's why I have a problem with people that say, oh, there's no evil people in the world. You've never worked the Los Angeles County Jail. You've never been a cop in a black and white. You have no idea what you're talking about when you walk around with your Pollyannish worldview saying, there's nobody evil in the world. They're just misunderstood. Really? What do you call Syrian Muslims who cut people's heads off and make them scream like an animal? Oh, they're just misunderstood. Really? No, they're evil. They are evil. They are disciples of the devil. The Bible knows about two types of people. Children of light, children of darkness. We'll do another Bible study on that. That'll fascinate you. And your liberal mentality will just leave. They'll say, okay, the Bible's, I have to believe it. There's evil people and good people. Okay? I remember several serial killers when I was working in the Los Angeles County Jail. I would ask them, hey, can you say the name Jesus? And see, the cops, we eat real good in the jail. We have our own dining room, okay? It's the officer's dining room. They feed us very well. That's why a lot of the cops in, are in the jail. You know, we come out of the academy all, all slim and trim, and then we look like, you know, we look like uh, Bob's, uh, uh, Bob's Big Boy commercial after a couple of years working in the jail because they feed you real well. They feed you anything you want, okay? So I told some of these guys, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you anything you want from the officer's dining room, and they know that the food's good there. Ribeye steak, filet, anything you want. I said, I'll feed you officer's food. I'll go get it for you, and I'll bring it to you if you can say the name Jesus. Not one, ser all the serial killers, <laughs> you give me officer's food? I said, man, order up, dude. What do you want? You want ribeye? You want T-bone? What do you want? What do I have to say? Say Jesus is Lord. Nobody could do it. When I would look at the serial killer, you know, of course, we'd be separated by bars. And I'd say, just say Jesus is Lord and you can get anything you want and I'll bring it up myself. I'll smuggle it because you're not supposed to feed him, you know, the officer's food and, and the guys on death row. They couldn't do it. I remember a couple of guys, it freaked me out. It felt like a nice kid went down my spine. They would try to say Jesus. They would try because they wanted to eat my food. But, the good food that the cops ate, but they could. It's like they had glue in their mouth. They go, it's like they had glue in their mouth, and their faces are contorting. And I could just feel a chill in the air. You could feel the presence of evil. Several people that I arrested, a couple of Satanists that I arrested, I remember uh, had them in the backseat of my car, taken them to jail and stuff. I said, hey, I'm just curious. Can you say Jesus? This one guy that was a consecrated Satanist, son, I'll spare you the details of what he did when we arrested him. Uh, he said, I can't say that name. That's the only name I can't say. I said, dude, if you say it, uh, I'll stop by right now and we'll get you something to eat because you're never going to see the light of day again. I'll order you whatever you want. I said, because you're never going to see the free world again. Can you say Jesus? He goes, you buy me anything I want. I said, anything you want. Couldn't say it. So I want to make sure that I'm in good company tonight. So I'm going to, on three, I'm going to say one, two, three. And on three, I'm going to ask you to say Jesus is Lord. And I'm watching, and I'm telling you, me and Ray are watching, but we may have to just stand up and rush somebody right now if they can't say it. I don't know. So uh, let's just, just so we can feel at ease here that we're all part of the familia de Dios, the family of God, team Jesus. Let's say Jesus is Lord on three. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. All right. I'm in good company. I'm with family. All right. John 16, 13 and 14. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us. John 16, 13 and 14. The Bible tells us. But when he comes, this is Jesus speaking. But when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. 
He will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare to you the things that are coming. The word of the Lord. Now, how does the Holy Spirit speak to us? The Holy Spirit speaks to us two ways in two modalities. Number one, through the church, through Holy Mother the Church. The Catholic Church, especially its official organ, the magisterium, is the voice of God for us. When the Catholic Church says, thus saith the church and thus saith the Lord, that homosexual marriage is wrong, it's intrinsically evil, that's a definitive statement from the Holy Spirit through the church. And by the way, the church has made those declarations, abortion, homosexual marriage, euthanasia, cloning, embryonic fetal stem cell research. I mean, we can go on and on. The church has made statements definitively that are intrinsically evil and disordered and a grave offense before a holy God and sinful. And those declarations come from the Holy Spirit who continues to guide the church into all truth. However, the Holy Spirit can also guide you personally. For example, when you examine your conscience, you're forming your conscience, you want to go to confession. And you say, Lord, just help me. I want to just recall my sins and make a good confession. The Holy Spirit at that moment will help you because you're calling upon the Holy Spirit. Also, the Holy Spirit helps you. For example, St. Augustine says that when we, read, when we read the Bible, you should always ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, help me, enlighten me, illumine me, help me understand what's your message, what, what are you trying to tell me? So St. Augustine says anytime you, you read the Bible, you should always ask the Holy Spirit to open up your eyes and ears so that you can understand the message of God's Word. Okay. John 14, verses 1 through 3. Now we're on the part where it says, Jesus leads us to the Father. John 14, 1 and 3. It says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God. Have faith also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. Now, the Greek word here, by the way, for dwelling, it actually says in Greek, many mansions. Okay, that's a, kind of a poor translation in the English. It doesn't say in the Greek, it doesn't say dwelling places. In the Greek, it says there are many mansions. I like that. I don't know about you. There ain't no apartments in heaven, no condos, no townhouses, no Section 8 housing, no mobile homes. There are mansions. And if you get to heaven, you're going to have a mansion. You're going to be like the Beverly Hills, the Beverly Hillbillies. Remember them? Okay, we're like... From rags to riches, man, from earth to heaven, a mansion for every one of us, if we make it there. And here's a beautiful thing. The rent's already paid. How? By the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Give it up for Jesus. Give it up for Jesus. <laughs> rent paid. Paid in full. Paid by the blood. For John 14, 1, 3. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. The Greek word is mansions. If there were not, would I... What I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. Okay, so what's the point that I'm making? Go back to my notes, okay? We're like, in, we're in the vortex of God's love. Here's the point that I'm making with the first part of this Bible study. We're the object of God's love. We are the beloved, and everything revolves around us. In other words, here we are, the vortex, and God sends the Holy Spirit to us, we receive the Holy Spirit at baptism. Now the Holy Spirit is telling us, love Jesus. Open your heart to Jesus. Follow Jesus. Be a disciple of Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing every single day in our Catholic soul. And finally, we have that eureka moment. That's called conversion. Where all of a sudden we say, yes, it's time. It, it's time to stop being a lukewarm Catholic. It's time to stop being a Ash Wednesday, Easter, Christmas Catholic. And it's time to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's time to give in my heart. It's time to fall in love with Him. It's time to follow Him. That's called conversion. The Holy Spirit has been doing that since the moment you were baptized. But then something happens. Maybe a person invites you somewhere. You hear a song. You go to a Bible study, a prayer group, a retreat. You pray a rosary. You go to a funeral. Something happens where you start connecting the dots and you say, yes. Yes, Jesus, I do want to follow you. It's because the Holy Spirit has been impelling you since the day you were baptized. And then the third part, once you open your heart to Jesus and say, Yes, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple. What happens? Now Jesus leads you back to the Father. Because that's where we're going. All of us 
are on planet earth right now, we're having this great adventure with Jesus. Once we open our heart to Jesus, we're having a great adventure with Jesus. And Jesus is taking us back to the Father's house. We are the vortex. We are the eye of the hurricane. And God the Trinity just surrounds us. And God the Trinity is here to love us and take us home where we belong. The United States, Mexico, Canada, Europe, that is not home. It's a P.O. box. You're all just passing by. We're not going to be here forever. 100% of us are going to die. 100% of us. Somebody your age died yesterday. Somebody your age died today. Somebody your age will die tomorrow. Don't get too comfortable here. This ain't home. We're just passing by. Our home is to be with Jesus and Mary and all those that love Him in a great family reunion. Amen? Amen. Go back to the notes. The love of God the Father. The two largest religions in the world are Catholicism and Islam. Catholicism has about 1.2 billion members. Islam has about 1.3, 1.4 billion members. Islam is larger than the Catholic Church, unfortunately. You know why? We used to be larger than the Muslims up until 2003. Up in 2003, the Muslims surpassed the Catholics. Why? Several reasons. Number one, Muslims practice forced conversions. So if you're a Christian living in the Middle East, Muslims will go right to your house. They'll say, you Christian? Catholic, Orthodox, God, were you Christian? Yeah. Okay. You can't be a Christian here. You better convert or we'll kill you. And so in the Middle East, Christians can't own weapons. The, the police doesn't help them out. The government doesn't help them out. So you've got terrorists that come to your house with swords and machine guns saying, convert or die. So there's many Christians that out of fear, they just convert. They say, well, I need to pay my bills and stuff. Now, you can live in a Muslim country if you're a Christian, but you have to pay what's called in Arabic a jizya tax, which means an extortion fee. So if you're a Christian that lives in the Middle East, say in Syria or Iraq, Muslims will come to your house and they'll tax you so high that you'll be broke forever. In other words, they'll, they'll tax, tax you like, for example, uh, 70, 70 cents on every dollar you make. And that's extortion money. You've got to pay the local Muslim mob so they won't beat you up. They won't rape your wife. They won't rape your children. It's called a jizya tax. It's an extortion tax. It's like what the mafia does to businesses. Pay us this every month or we're going to come and start killing your family one at a time. So in the Middle East, our Catholic Christian brothers right now, they have three choices. Number one, they say either pay the jizya tax and you can be a Christian here, but you can't practice your faith publicly. You can't wear a crucifix. You'll be arrested if you wear a crucifix in the Middle East in a Muslim country. You will be arrested. You can't walk around with a Bible. You will be arrested. You can't make the sign of the cross. You can't show any external religion towards Jesus Christ in the Middle East. You'll be arrested. You can practice your faith quietly in your house, you know, uh, hidden from everybody, but you can't share your faith publicly in the street. You can't share your faith publicly at work. And then you got to pay the jizya tax, the extortion tax to the Muslims. Or if you say, no, I don't believe in Islam, and I reject Muhammad, and I reject everything you guys teach. Well, then they'll say, you better leave or we'll kill you. You got one week or we're going to cut your head off. That's why Islam is growing so much, because of forced conversions. Also, Islam is growing so much because they allow, they laugh about it. You can see on YouTube, they say, we're going to take over the world. You know why? Muslims are allowed to have four wives. Plus a prostitute. So Muslim males are allowed in the Quran to have five women. Four wives and a prostitute. They laugh. I've heard, I heard some of the terrorists from ISIS say, you Christians can only have one wife. We can have four wives plus a prostitute. So we're going to outpopulate you guys by 2025, 2030. We'll take over the world. They're laughing. They're saying, by 2025, the White House will be flying a terrorist flag. 
They said, because we're going to outpopulate all of you because we can have four wives. Now, as Christians, here's where we've dropped the ball. You know, and, and, and Catholic Christians, we, we were, you know, it's our fault also. We've bought into the whole, the whole propaganda, the, the lie, the devil's lie of abortion, killing our children. We kill 3,300 American babies every day in the United States. Okay? And many Christians, Catholics and Protestants and Jews, they're not Christians, but, you know, we can lump them in there also. Many of them don't even have babies. They just practice birth control. They don't have any babies. Or they just want to live in these, you know, cohabitating, uh, hookup relationships with no commitment, no children, no family. The purpose of getting married is to have a family. That's the purpose of getting married. That's what God intended. And so as a result of diminishing family sizes within Christianity, Islam has surpassed us in numbers as of 2003. The worst country right now, the worst country right now in terms of population growth is Italy. Italy and France, excuse me. The average family in Italy and France has one child per family. One child. Guess how many children it takes to replace your dead in the country? 2.2 children. In order to replace your dead, every married woman must have 2.2 children to replace the dead. In the U.S., we're replacing our dead. You know why? Because of Latinos and Philippines. <laughs> so they're coming to the rescue here. All right. So uh, there's also a third, a third uh, it's not a religion, but it, it, it's the devil's religion. It's called secular humanism. Secular humanism is the most pervasive ideology in the West. What does secular humanism mean? It simply means people that don't believe in God, they're agnostics. People that just believe in me, myself, and I. It's all about me. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Wine, women, and song. If it feels good, do it. Look out for number one. Okay? Only the strong survive. That's secular humanism. When did that start? That was born in the 60s with the Woodstock hippie, free love, peace, drug generation. And many of those teenagers from the 60s Woodstock era, guess what? They have suits and ties right now, and they're running our country. Most of these congressmen were Woodstock hippies. The president, look at, it, uh, look at him on, on, on the internet when he was a young person. He was a pot-smoking, cocaine-smoking, secular humanist. These are the people that are running our country. Are you wondering why our country is in such a mess? They got suits and ties now, but they still think the same way. They're secular humanists. What's a secular humanist? God is not important. I'm in, I, I call the shots. I got power. I went to Harvard. I make the laws. Whatever's right in my eyes, that's right for everybody. That's a secular humanist. They run this country and they're bullies. Because they got power. There's an old saying that goes... Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So you got three, three forces right on the world that really are trying to take over planet Earth. Catholics are called to take over planet Earth and conquer for Jesus Christ. How? Through faith, hope, love, preach the truth, share our faith, forgive people. Offer sacrifices, do penance, evangelize, defend the faith. Be merciful. That's how Catholics want to take over the world. Islam wants to take over the world through terrorism. And secular humanists want to take over the world by getting highly educated at Harvard and Berkeley and UCLA and Stanford and then going and becoming governors and mayors and presidents and federal court judges. Then, then imposing their atheist, atheistic ideology upon the rest of us. You want to see a good example of secular humanism? Look at California. Look what they've done to the state. Who would have thought that homosexuals could get married? We wouldn't even be talking about this five, five years ago, ten years ago. Because everybody has common sense. We know this is disorder. This is perverted. What two men do naked in the bedroom. We know that. And now it's legal? Are you kidding me? Is this microphone on? Huh? Is this microphone on? 
What kind of a world are we living in? It's a world gone mad. Why? Secular humanists have taken over this country. Killing babies who imposed that in 1973. Secular humanists in the Supreme Court. Killing babies. You know why they do that? Because they want to get rid of blacks and Latinos. You don't believe me? Go to Planned Parenthood's website and type in on the search engine, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. She started abortion because she was a racist. Specifically, she started Planned Parenthood to exterminate blacks. She called a subdivision of Planned Parenthood the Negro Extermination Project. How? Through abortion. And she said it. How am I going to get rid of blacks? I'm going to use educated blacks to tell uneducated blacks to sell them on abortion. Oh, who does she use? Barack Obama, Jesse Jackson, L. Sharpton. Educated blacks to tell uneducated blacks, hey, this is good for our community. Planned Parenthood. We live in a world gone mad. You come to my Bible studies, you're going to hear the voice of reason. You know why I seem kind of crazy? Because I'm normal. So what I'm saying is, saying, I can't believe he's saying that. Yes, I'm saying it. What I'm saying is normal. And many Catholics think like, Ooh, cuckoo. <laughs> what I'm saying is common sense. I've got a PhD in common sense. And unfortunately, common sense isn't too common anymore. Point number two. God and religion. Here's the way I see it. I know these young people are saying, I can't believe this guy. Because I'm telling you, my, my, because even my kids, i got young adults at home. So I get it. My young adults tell me, Dad, the message that you say about Catholicism and what we get in colleges and in high school and our public school education, it's like completely opposite of what you say. I get it. I get it. I know. Because our, and I'll tell you why, young people, something you don't know, I'll share with you. When did our education go south? Here it is. I've done the research, so I'll just give it to you. In 1971, there was a a, a very respected atheist philosopher by the name of John Dewey. You can look all this up. This is all common information that's on history pages. John Dewey didn't like the Catholic Church. And prior to 1971, there was a lot of God talk in public schools. Prayer, and just a lot of faith talk in public schools. John Dewey said, hmm, no, can't have this God talk. He went to Washington, D.C., gave a lecture before the National Education Association, which is a governing board of education in the in national, the national governing board. He said, you know what? We, we have to eradicate all this mention of God and faith and religion from our public schools. We can't have that. We need to give our kids a secular humanist education. Secular, that word means world. Humanist means that the only thing that you should believe is what you can see, okay? And so John Dewey convinced the NEA that we have to change our textbooks. So he wrote a paper called Values Clarification. In this paper, he basically said, we have to eradicate any mention of God and religion in our education. The NEA, NEA said, yes, let's vote. After they heard his presentation, He's a, he's a, 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 a Columbia University professor, highly respected amongst the academic elites. They said, hey, we agree with John Dewey. As of 1971, all the textbooks were changed. Any mention of God, religion, faith, Jesus, eradicated. And so from 1971 to the present moment, everybody who steps into from kindergarten to college you receive what's called a values clarification education. You didn't even know that. What does that mean? It means you receive an education where there's nothing right, there's nothing wrong. Everything is just based on your subjective reason. The teacher will put out a set of propositions 
And it's up to you to decide based on your moral compass if it's right or if it's wrong. Unfortunately, a study was done recently out of, the, out of 50 professors in, in, uh, in, uh, in college and university today. Out of every 50 f professors, 49 are liberals, which means they don't go to church, they don't believe in God, they're probably pot smoking, living with different women and stuff. They live reckless lives. One out of 50 professors is a traditional conservative, like moi, me, right here. You're looking at a traditional conservative gentleman. I've been married to one wife for 31 years. The same wife. I'm not going to trade her in. She's not going to trade me in. We got married in the Catholic Church 31 years ago. Okay? I don't have children from other women. I don't have... I've never been a drug addict or an alcoholic. I have no tattoos. I'm a traditional Latino American that has traditional values. But my values today would be a freak show. What? You never had any addictions? You don't watch pornography? You don't masturbate? You got one wife? Are you kidding me? You got no tattoos? What's the matter with you? Because I'm a traditional conservative man. What does conservative mean? It means I believe, based on what this country was founded on, the coins, one nation under God. I believe in conserving faith, family, and religious freedom. And that makes me a freak today. That makes me an absolute freak. Join the club. Because freaks are like us, we're going to go to heaven. Amen? Amen? So you young people, the reason you nod your head when I say these things is because you don't know. You've received a values clarification and you don't even know what you're receiving. You've been, you're being programmed not to believe in the Judeo-Christian ethic. You're being taught to decide for yourself what's right and wrong. That's very dangerous. Deciding for yourself what's right and wrong? Are you kidding? Well, imagine if we would have said, Hitler, you know what? Whatever you think is right, that's right for you. Wow. Imagine that logic. Hey, Joseph Stalin. You Russian communist monster. Hey, if it feels good for you to kill 41 million people, that's fine. Hey, male, male see tongue. If it feels good to kill 2 million Cambodians, hey, knock yourself out. Are you kidding? Allowing people to decide what's right and wrong for themselves is dangerous. Do a little research. The biggest mass murders in the 20th century that I just named right now, all had PhDs from Ivy League universities. Highly educated men. Education doesn't impress me. You know what impresses me? Faith. Faith. The biggest monsters in the 20th century, the biggest mass murders, have been highly educated, Ivy League trained men. Seems to be ignorant people, ignorant peasants like us, we can't even imagine cutting people's heads off or, uh, you know, baking people in gas ovens and making curtains out of their skin. It doesn't even entertain a simple person like me. Why? Because I'm normal. I'm traditional. I'm conservative. Go back to the notes. Okay, Islam. For Muslims... Allah is Arabic for God, is not viewed as a father, but as a master who orders his slaves to obey strict rules. Allah has no relationship with them on earth or in heaven. Muslims obey Allah's commands in order to gain entry into paradise. Their salvation is based on works. Islam teaches that Allah, which is God in Arabic, only loves Muslims, and Allah hates unbelievers. Who's an unbeliever? You are, you're, if you're not Muslim, you're an unbeliever according to Islam. I've quote, like, look what I just quoted. I quoted from their book. It's called the Quran. That's the name of their book. And the, and the word surah, that means chapter in Arabic. Okay? Here's what it says in the Quran. That's their book, the Muslim's book, that they consider that the word of God. It says this, quote, 
Allah is an enemy to those who reject faith. That's in Surah chapter 2 verse 98. Muslims insist that Allah is unknowable. This God can't be known is different from our view of the God of the Bible, whom we call Father. Referring to God as Father is blasphemy for a Muslim, and for a Muslim to say such a thing would put him at risk of hell. In short, Allah is not a Father who seeks our love, but a Master who demands obedience. Muslims vehemently deny that the Allah of the Quran is the God of the Bible. Okay? If you want to learn more about Islam, I got a couple of CDs like I go hours into. I'm one of the, you know, my, you know what my wife calls me? She calls me, she goes, you're my Latino nerd. You know why she calls me that? Because all I do is either church and pray, work out. I'm an ex-fighter, so I'm, I'm old, but I still like to work out and read. That's all I do. If I'm not working out, I'm doing something in the church. I'm going to mass, praying a rosary, reading my Bible, or I'm reading. That's all I do. People say, don't you play golf? I don't got time for that. The rules going to hell in a handbasket. Are you kidding? Don't you just go like to go fishing? You know, I tell people, when I die and I'm in heaven, I'm going to have all kinds of V-time, vacation time. Right now, I got to just go for it. I got to spend myself for Jesus. I need to wake Catholics up. I got a book coming out in two weeks. I'll bring it. My book is called, in English, it's called Catholics Wake Up. It's coming out in two weeks. It's going to be a national release through Servant Books. I'll bring it next month's Bible study. It's called Catholics Wake Up. And it's a book that I've written because so many Catholics just look at me like they're drooling. Are you kidding me? Believing in Jesus is a matter of life and death. This ain't no joke. Let me tell you something. I don't think Joan Rivers is dying, is, 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 uh, is laughing right now. I know she was a comedian and may her soul rest in peace. I hope when she died, I hope she said, Jesus, I accept you. Forgive me for 40 years of blasphemy and of using my mouth for, for filthy language. I hope she repented and made her peace with God. Because let me tell you something. There's no joke when you die. This ain't a comedy club. You only got one chance at life, and you better not make a joke at it. I take it very serious. I wake up every day and think about my salvation every day. And I say, I better do things right every day and warn other people, because people are dying today. And the way things look in the world right now, things don't look good. We need Catholics to wake up other Catholics and say, hey, dude, it's time to come back to church and get right with Jesus. Secular humanism, go to my notes. I got entire talks on this, by the way. Okay, these are just, I got a whole, if you want to know, what, I got a whole 60 minute talk. It's called Secular Humanism versus the Christian Worldview, where I go deep into this stuff. Okay, that's why my wife calls Bert me her Latino nerd. Why? Because I'm not reading La Opinion or, or the funnies. I'm reading good books, research. I need to know who these terrorists are. I need to know what's in the Quran. I need to know about politics. I need to know what the Democrat Party platform, the Republican Party platform. I need to know the HHS mandate when Barack Obama wants to pat, you know, uh, make everybody in this country bow down to. These things are important for me. I don't waste my time. There's, they not, there's no time to waste on watching Gilligan's Island reruns and eating bonbons and chicharrones and scratching your stomach. Secular humanism. Our culture is predominated by the ideal of freedom, fraternity, and equality. These words are the three key words of the French Revolution. And because freedom, independence, and autonomy of the human being is so important, the Western culture went so far as to, den as to deny God the Father, who is the very principle of authority, the one who gave us birth and created us in our mother's womb, as the Bible says in Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. Then there was Sigmund Freud, a psychotherapist who was very anti-religion, and he said that religious faith is a neurotic illusion and wishful thinking. 
Freud threw suspicion on the figure of the father saying that in every male child there's a hidden secret, a desire to kill his father in order to possess their mother as the only object of love. So Freud said that God the Father is just a projection of our uncertain, fluctuating relationship with our earthly father. God the Father is so absent in our culture because many people have had a bad experience with their earthly father who may be violent, alcoholic, drug addict, womanizer, weak, or simply absent from their lives. Okay, I agree with Freud in one sense, and then here's where I disagree with Freud, okay? Where Freud said that religious faith is a neurotic illusion and wishful thinking, obviously I disagree with Freud, okay? That's how he described religious people, that we have neurosis, okay? They have delusions. That's the way he described religious faith. Well, the fact of the matter is, the reason I know he's wrong is because there's a person called Jesus Christ of Nazareth who lived 2,000 years ago, who said he was the son of God, walked on the Galilean hills for 33 years, performed 36 miracles. He said, destroy this body and in three days I will raise it up. He rose from the dead. Over 515 people saw the risen Jesus Christ. Over a thousand people saw him ascend into heaven. And so Jesus Christ is not, a, is not a myth. He's not a legend. So Freud has to deal with this question. Jesus Christ is either the son of God or he's a liar. Take your pick, Freud. Stand by one. Make a decision. I have. I say he's the son of God and he can be trusted. What does Freud say? I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. Freud right now knows, right now, because he's been dead for a long time, he knows that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Lord of all. Now he knows it. Now here's where I agree with Freud. If you look at the notes, Freud said, Freud threw suspicion. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, he, he's whack. Freud was very, obviously very off here. Freud threw suspicion on the figure of the father, saying that in every male child there's a hidden secret, a desire to kill his father in order to possess their mother as the only object of love. They teach this garbage in public schools. How do I know? I went to public school. I remember when I was in San Fernando High School in 1979, and my, psych, my uh, psychology teacher said, oh, by the way, and for him, his pope was Freud. He said, all of you right here? And I'm like, you know, 17-year-old. Y'all want to have sex with your mom, don't you? I'm like, what is he talking about? Freud said so. Freud, Sigmund Freud, nobody can question him. He's a great psychotherapist. He's a G I'm looking at him like, I felt like punching this guy. What? And all of us are looking at each other, Latinos in San Fernando High School, like, what's this guy? I want to have sex with Sir, I've never wanted to have sex with my mom. Trust me, never. Hasn't even crossed my thought for a millisecond. This is what they teach in public school, okay? Sigmund Freud is the Pope. So kids walk around sexually confused. Do I want to have sex with my dad? Because he also talked that girls want to have sex with their father. That's why girls really hate the mother. It's called the Electra Complex. And they teach this right now. This is dangerous. This is bad philosophy. This is pushing sin and immorality under the guise, under the umbrella of education. Ah. Where do I look at the italics? I wrote, I wrote in the italics, it's my comments. I put, uh, I agree with this, the last part, where, where, where Freud said, God, um, Freud said that God the Father is just a projection of our uncertain, fluctuating relationship with our earthly father. And, here, and uh, Freud says, God the Father is so absent in our culture because many people have had a bad experience with their earthly father. I agree with that. Look at my comments there. I agree with this. There are, there, these are some of the practical reasons why some people grow up with the fear of God the Father. Even Dr. Paul Vitz, a friend of mine, he's a great Catholic psychologist, he says, he says this, he wrote a book, it's actually called uh, The Faith of the Father, it's the Psychology of Atheism. Dr. Paul Vitz states this, he goes, the psychological source of militant atheism is the absence of a good father. You'll find people that say they don't believe in God. Every time a young person tells them that, you always see that they have a defective or a wounded father relationship. That's the only thing I would agree with Freud here. Freud says that people will tend 
You look at your earthly father, if he's good, it's easy to believe in God. Now, I don't want to brag, but I got three young adults, they totally believe in God. I think I've been decent. I think I've been a decent father, okay? God will be the judge of that. But my three young adults, totally in love with God, totally fired up for Jesus. Pray, go to mass, go to confession, pray the rosary, they, they get it. Because for them, God the Father, they say, well, if he's anything like dad, then he's got to be pretty good. Now, if a kid has a bad experience of a father, it's very easy for that kid to move away from God the Father saying, wait a minute, if my dad's a monster, God the Father must be a monster. I don't I want none of that. So there's that projection that does happen. That's why there's so much atheist, atheism amongst our kids. Because there's so many poor father figures. So many poor father figures. So it pushes young people into atheism. Let's look what Pope John Paul II wrote. He's a saint, by the way. Saint Pope John Paul II wrote, Original sin attempts to abolish fatherhood, destroying its rays, which permeate the created world, placing in doubt the truth about God who is love, and leaving man only with a sense of the master-slave relationship. Original sin, what does that mean? Every one of us are sons of Adam and Eve in our human nature. All of us that were born, were born into the family of Adam and Eve. How do we, and that's, that's, those are the first parents of the human race. And as a result of Adam and Eve's sin and rebellion, they have transmitted their nature, their fallen nature to us. So every one of us that's born, we're born with that fallen nature, which means we have a tendency to rebel, a tendency towards sin, a tendency towards evil. That's called concupiscence. It's in the catechism. It's a fancy word that means as a result of our fallen nature, as a result of our, of our coming from Adam and Eve in our human nature, we have this tendency towards sin, towards evil. Now, how are we taken out of the family of Adam and Eve and brought into the family of Jesus Christ through baptism? At baptism, God poured His Spirit into you. Now, because of the Spirit that you have, now you have the power to resist temptation. You have the power to overcome sin. You have the power to do the right things, to do good, things that are just and decent and, and virtuous because God the Holy Spirit lives in you. However, you have to cooperate with God the Holy Spirit that lives in you. Many people don't cooperate, so even though they're baptized Catholics, they live like monsters because they suppress the voice of God that's in their soul. Let's go, uh, Pope John Paul II, he says, Refusal of God's fatherly love and of his loving gifts is always at the root of humanity's divisions. In other words, uh, the entire human race is divided as a result of resisting who God is. Because what does God want? Simple. Here's what God wants. I'm going to make it very simple. Okay? God sent Jesus Christ into the world. Jesus, the Son of God, lived a perfect life for 33 years. Perfect life. No sin. Performed 36 miracles. Rose from the dead. Gave us an example of how to live, how to love, how to forgive. Died for our sins. Opened up the gates of heaven on Ascension Thursday. And so now we have the potential of going to heaven if we walk in the obedience of faith. Well, planet Earth is divided into all kinds of religions. What's the role of the Catholic Church? The role of the Catholic Church is through Jesus Christ and His vicar, the designated Pope, we as Catholics are called to bring every religion into the Catholic Church to reunite the scattered family of Adam and Eve and so that we can all go to heaven with God the Father as a family. That's the goal of the Catholic Church. I want to see every Muslim become a Catholic. I want to see, see every Jew become a Catholic. I want to see every Protestant, Buddhist, Confucius, Shinto, Taoist become a Catholic. Why? The Catholic Church is a religion that Jesus Christ started. It's the family of God, the worldwide family of God. And this is where Jesus Christ wants to save us in and through the church that he started. So our mission as Catholics is to bring the whole world through 
reason, faith, hope, love into the fullness of truth, which is the Catholic Church. Quite a tall order. It's a tall order. But that's what we're supposed to do. When you die, you'll stand before Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? Jesus Christ is not going to be impressed with anything. Oh, your GPA? Oh, how many trophies did you have? Oh, you, you lettered in high school? Oh, you ran the LA Marathon? What college did you go to? How big was your house? How many cars did you have? How much money did you make? Wow, let me see your retirement home over in Big Bear. None of that's going to impress Jesus. You know what's going to impress him? You're going to go naked to heaven. Naked. You're only going to take your faith with you. What did you do for him here? How did you live your life here as a Catholic? Were you loyal or were you a Nancy Pelosi? Were you a Joe Biden Catholic? Huh? Were you a Mayor of Villarreal Catholic? What kind of Catholic are you? You're one of those Judases? Or you're the real deal? Life is short. None of us are going to make it to 100. Hope you decide now if you're going to follow Jesus. Tomorrow's guaranteed to nobody. Catholicism. Let's wrap it up here. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, said that all good things come in three. We believe there is one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal, and co-majestic. Three persons in one God. The Holy Trinity is not one plus one plus one equals three. That's triplex. The Holy Trinity is one times one times one equals one. That's triunity. Let's focus on God the Father, the first person of the Holy Trinity. At Holy Mass, during the recitation of the Nicene Creed on Sundays, we pray, quote, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. During Holy Mass, we also pray the Gloria, where we say, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father. Close quote. We borrow this understanding from the Jews. The Jews call God Avinu Malkenu. Can you say that? Avinu Malkenu. You just spoke Hebrew right now, okay? Avinu Malkenu means our Father, our King. That's what the Jews call God. Avinu Malkenu. The Jews call God many names. They call God Abba, which means Daddy. The Jews call God Adonai, which means Lord. The Jews call God Avinu Malkenu, which means our Father, our King. The Jews call God El Elyon, which means the God of Almighty Blessings. The Jews call God Elohim, which means God the Creator. The Jews call God El Shaddai, the God who is all-powerful. The Jews call God Rohi, Shepherd. The, the Jews call God Rafa, which means healer. All our, our understanding of God, it comes from the Jewish titles that the Jews give God. Go back to our notes. This is an ancient form of prayerfully addressing God for the Hebrews in the Old Testament. As Catholics, we also use this Hebrew title. We call God our Father. We relate to Him as Father, and God looks at us as His children. 1 John 3, 1. This is one of the most beautiful Bible verses that brings peace to my heart. I have to read this every couple of days because if you could tell, I'm pretty wound up, okay? I'm pretty, I, 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 I'm pretty serious about life. So, you know, I got to decompress. I got to decompress every, that's why I work out and I pray and I try to eat right because, you know, I could, I'd be a good candidate for a heart attack because I'm pretty intense about stuff. I watch the news, I say, I can't believe they did that. Oh, no way. I, that law passed. Unbelievable. I'm talking to myself. My wife says, calm down, calm down. I need, you, I need you another 30 years. My wife thinks I'm going to have a coroner any second now. She says, I'm going to turn off the television. I said, no, but I, I, we got to stay informed, honey. We got to stay informed. We got to fight. We got to fight. We got to pray. 
We gotta let people know. So that's what it is living with me. <laughs> You're gonna say, man, your wife's gonna be a saint. <laughs> First John chapter 3, verse 1. Look what the Bible says. Oh, this is so beautiful. See what love the Father has bestowed on us. And you know the word love, by the way, in your Bible? You know what the word love is in, in, in the Greek New Testament? You know, I've told you before. It's what? Come on, you guys have been coming to a Bible study for agape. Agape. See what agape. That's the Greek word that John uses in the New Testament. The word agape means unconditional love. God loves us so much. Even though we're sinners, He still loves us. But He, want, he loves us so much that He wants us to change, to transform, to convert, to repent, to be holy. God's not satisfied with us as being sinners. God wants us to be saints. God's love, His unconditional love, wants to transform us. See what love the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called the children of God, yet so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do not know that when it is revealed, we shall be like Him. What does that mean? We shall be like Him. The pronoun there, it means in the afterlife, in the next world, we shall be like Jesus. That's what John's talking about. How is Jesus, his glorified body? The glorified body of Jesus Christ. He can walk through matter in heaven in our glorified bodies. We will be able to walk through matter. Jesus Christ in his glorified body risen from the dead was able to transport himself by speed of thought. In heaven, in our glorified bodies, no cars, no mopeds, no motorcycles, no scooters, no skateboards, no metro rail. You'll transport yourself in your glorified body through thought. You think and you're there. In heaven, the glorified body of Jesus Christ was 33 years old. In heaven, regardless of when you die, everybody in heaven will be the age of perfection, which the church says is 33 years old. That's when Jesus died at that age and rose. Jesus Christ will never age. We will never age. We will be like him, 33 years old, never to get sick, never to age, never to feel pain, no pain in heaven, no suffering, no crying, no, no weeping. Here on earth, earth is a valley of tears. You're going to cry a lot here. Oh, yeah, you're going to cry over and over again. You're going to bury your mom and your dad and your grandparents and your nino and your nina and your uncles and your cousins and your friends, and you will cry and cry and cry again because you were never meant to be happy, totally happy on planet Earth. Planet Earth is simply probation. Is simply a training camp to become saints. Planet Earth is a valley of tears. Planet Earth is a valley of the shadow of death. But we fear no evil because we know that God walks with us every day by the hand. Even when we don't feel His presence, He's there. Even when we feel we're all alone, He's there. Even when you're in your hospital room, dying of cancer, Nobody's around under those cold blankets looking at that, those banal walls and you're saying, where's my family? Where's my kids? Guess who's in that room with you? Jesus is. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus Christ is the great lover of our souls. When you have Jesus, you have everything. When you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. Wrap it up. 
St. Teresa of Lisieux, she's called St. Teresa of the Little Flower. She said this, To call God my father and to know myself as his child, that is heaven to me. God wants, doesn't want slaves. He wants sons and daughters. However, God cannot override the free will of each man. You got homework. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I want you to go home and open up your Bible, and I want you to look up all those ten Bible verses that speak about God the Father. And I want you to get a yellow marker and open up your Bible and mark every single Bible verse in your Bible. And I want you to read it three times. Each verse three times. So that it really, really sticks. And that you could know that you are loved. You are loved. I want you to tell somebody to your right and somebody to your left. Tell them, you are loved. Tell two people, you are loved. You are loved. Tell them. Don't you ever forget that. There would be no suicide in this world if people would know that they're loved by God. Though everybody may turn on you, God will never turn on you. God is faithful. God is true. God's mercy lasts forever. God's love is unconditional. God's love is perfect. It's boundless. God's love is forever. Psalm 23. Let's look at your notes and we'll wrap it up here. You've all heard this psalm. At every Catholic funeral, you, you hear this psalm. It's one of the favorite psalms at Catholic funerals. The first part I'm going to read, and what's in parentheses, that's my commentary. I'm commenting on each verse. I want you to read what's in the brackets. I'll read the first half, okay? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's read this verse together from Jeremiah 31, 3. All together. God is the Father who keeps His promises. He loves us with an everlasting love. Tell two people, God loves you with an everlasting love. Tell two people right now. Last comments. God is a gentleman. God is not a cosmic rapist. He will not force his love upon us. God the Father is like the sun. The rays of the sun cannot enter a house when the curtains are closed. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is truly the summary of the whole gospel. The Catechism says the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, is the most perfect of prayers. It is at the center of the scriptures. So we close in prayer as we lift up our eyes from our earthly home to our heavenly home by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Augustine says, To fall in love with God is the greatest of romances. To seek Him, the greatest adventure. To find Him, the greatest human achievement. I hope and pray that after this Bible study, for the rest of your life, 
you will know for sure that you are the object of God's unconditional love forever. No matter how many friends turn against you or family members, God will never leave you nor forsake you. You are God's masterpiece. Every single human person is God's masterpiece. Amen? Amen. Okay. I got this recorded, by the way. I brought it already. I got this talk, uh, the love of God, the Father, because I know people say, is it recorded? I got it recorded. I also want to mention just for... Today's the feast day of Our Lady Guadalupe. I, uh, I just did a new CD set. And it's, it's the best. I put the best of my research into this. It's called the, the Four Marian Dogmas in Scripture and Tradition. I took the four dogmas that we believe. Mary, Mother of God, Perpetual Virginity, Immaculate Conception, and Assumption of Mary. And I go deep into the Bible and history showing how old these teachings are about Mary. So this is new. I just redid this because the, the last one I did it was like 15 years ago. And I'm so much smarter than 15 years ago. <laughs> also, uh, here's a set that a lot of people like because a lot of Catholics get beat up about, oh, the church is full of child molesters, this, that, and the other. If you want to hear the truth, I got a seminar. It's called The Scandals of the Church. I get invited on television, English and Spanish, to debate this issue. And when I go, I make mincemeat of my opponents. Because I hit them with facts that they never heard of. And they say, oh, how can he be a Catholic? Because they're full of a child molester. They say, really? Hmm, okay. According to the best studies by uh, Dr. Phil Jenkins from Penn State University, there's about 0.5% of Catholic priests have been convicted of pedophilia. Uh, pedophilia, pedophilia. However, did you know that 1.7% of Protestant ministers have been convicted, excuse me, 3% of Protestant ministers have been convicted of pedophilia? 3% of Jewish rabbis have been convicted of pedophilia. Did you know that 10% of public school teachers have been convicted of pedophilia? So I hit them with the facts. When they come up against me, they say something stupid, I hit them with facts. They're like, wow, I just opened up a beehive with this guy. <laughs> so if, if you want to know how to defend the Catholic Church, any argument that they throw at you, I show you how to defend the Catholic Church with reason, using your noodle, okay? Your, God gave us an intellect not to be watching reruns all day, to study our faith and defend our faith from the pro propagandists and liars that we see out there. Also, for those of you that want to see a really good video on Mary, it's called What Every Catholic Needs to Know About Mary. I'm part of this video. It comes out on EWTN. It comes out on the, on the Catholic television. I'm one of the five experts that talks about the different aspects of Mary. And uh, if, if you want a, a DVD that will help people come back to church, seriously, what every Catholic needs to know about hell, okay? I mean, sometimes you need to motivate people. Sometimes, like, I don't know, it could be like negative motivation, but you know what? It gets people like, hmm, I never, uh, interesting. And here's one, in case you're ever wondering about the story of Our Lady Guadalupe, a lot of Latinos have T-shirts and beanies and bumper stickers and tattoos of Our Lady Guadalupe. They don't know the story. I said, dude, you know what she did for Mexico? No. Why'd you put on the tattoo? It looks cool. I said, do you love her? I'm not sure, but it looks cool. I got a three-hour DVD where I go through the whole story of Our Lady Guadalupe. The whole story. How she changed Mexico. If you know what Mexico was in the 14th and 15th century, you say, are you kidding me? Mexico was run by Aztecs and Mayans who worshipped devils. They worshipped demon gods in the big pyramids. And they also practiced cannibalism, that's eating people, that was part of the religious cult of Mexico, and they also practiced human sacrifices, cutting people's hearts out. You have no idea, no idea what Mexico used to do until the mother of God, this Jewish mama of ours, came from heaven to Mexico in 1531 in Tepeyac, Mexico, and changed that culture and brought Jesus Christ into a totally demon-possessed culture. If you want to hear the true story, here it is. In fact, I'll give this one for 50% off because I want you to know the story. Hell, 50% off. I want you to scare family members back to church. <laughs> this one, what every cat that needs to know about Mary, 50% off. Hey, let's go get some coffee. Thank you. God bless you.